In 1988, if you wanted to build your own power amplifier from a kit, you could have purchased the Hafler 500 for $775, or you could have purchased the already assembled kit for $900, which would be about $2,400 in 2024. It was rated at 255 watts per channel at not more than 0.025% from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and it boasted a flatness of plus or minus 0.5 dB over that range. It weighed in at a hefty 49 pounds. Now, I will show you the front and the back. There's really not a lot going on in the front. Then we'll take a peek around back and we'll pop the cover and see what it looks like. And then, of course, there will be measurements. And finally, I will tell you what I thought after listening to the Hafler 500. Here is the front of the Hafler 500. Nothing real exciting. We do have an on-off switch here, and it does have uh, an LED or lamp that comes on to tell you it's on. We do have our handles to make it easier to move about, and it is 19-inch rack mountable. Here is the rear of the Hafler 500. You can see the output for the uh, fan that moves the air across the heat sinks. We do have uh, speaker fuses here and here. They're 10 amp fuses, and we do have our inputs here. And then we have our three-way binding posts here. Here is what the Hafler 500 looks like with the cover removed. Our output devices are here, and there are actually some on the bottom. And they're FETs. You can see our fan is here. We've got more fuses inside. We have two big capacitors for the power supply. And then we have our transformer here, and you can kind of just see there's a circuit board over here. And then there is another one over here. We'll see a different view of those coming up. Here's one uh, view of those. Uh, I'll call them driver boards for the output devices here. Let's see what else we have. Here's another view, a close-up view, kind of seeing what's going on. As far as I can tell, this is all original. And this is just another view of the heat sinks. And you can see how the, uh, the fan would blow the air across out through the back. Here's our standard THD SNR plot at 1 kilohertz with the DH500 putting out about 5 watts into 8 ohms. And you can see our THD is really, really low, looking real good there. SNRs, 86 dB or better. THD plus noise, minus 86 dB or better. So the gain is right around 26 dB. Right now, the DH500 is hooked up to 4 ohm loads and we're putting out 5 watts or almost 5 watts, depending on which channel, into 4 ohm loads. And you can see that the gain is still right around 26 dB. Now, the SNRs have uh, dropped by maybe 3 dB when we went to the 4 ohm loads. And you can see the THD is still looking pretty, pretty good. Uh, we would be meeting the spec requirement here. Now, if you compare this to the 8 ohm load case, Pretty much the same. The, the SNRs, as I said, are down about 3 dB, and the THD plus noise is down about 3 dB from what it was with 8 ohm loads, but that's kind of to be expected. Also, this power level dropped by 3 dB from where it was with 8 ohm loads. This is a plot of the frequency response of the DH500, with it putting out about 5 watts into 8 ohm loads, and it is going from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. The specification is that the amplifier should have a flatness across that range of plus or minus 0.5 dB, and we are definitely meeting that requirement. We're maybe down at two-tenths of a dB here at 20 kilohertz. And you can also see the channels are pretty well balanced, too, within about 0.1 dB. So overall, this guy is performing admirably. Here is the frequency response from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with the DH500 putting out 5 watts into 4 ohm loads. When you compare it to the 8 ohm load case, you will see that we have a little bit more loss here at 20 kilohertz, maybe, oh, I would say a tenth of a dB, not really anything to get exciting about it there. At the high end, at the low end of the band, it looks about the same. So overall, it is definitely meeting its plus or minus half a dB requirement, and the channels are still balanced to within about 0.1 dB. Here is the DH500's output impedance from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Now, 
it does have a specification for damping factor at 1 kilohertz and at 10 kilohertz. At 10 kilohertz, it should be at least 60. And if we calculate it, it will come out to about 100. So it's better than the requirement at 10 kilohertz. And at 1 kilohertz, the damping factor should be better than 200. And if you calculate it out, it's about 134. So it's not as good as the spec, but 134 is a pretty good damping factor from all of the ones that I have measured. Here we have the DH500 putting out 262 watts into 8 ohms. Both channels are obviously being driven. And there is a specification that at 1 kilohertz, the THD should be not more than 0.002%. Well, we're off by a factor of 10 at 0.02%. 4 or 0.022%. So I'm not going to really worry about a THD that is this small, not quite meeting spec, uh, but it's still looking really, really good. You can see both channels have almost identical gain. The SNRs are at least 88 dB, and the THD plus noise is better than minus 72 dB. So this guy is looking really good. And in case you were wondering what the harmonics look like, you can see that our odd or third harmonic is higher than the even or second harmonic, which is kind of what you expect with a solid state amplifier. So right now I have the standard THD SNR plot at one kilohertz with the DH500 putting out around 300 watts into four ohm loads. And you can see the gain still about 26 dB. SNRs look pretty good, uh, pretty close to 90 dB, and the THD plus noise is at least minus 71 dB. So overall, it looks pretty good. Now, there are no specifications that I could find for 4 ohm load cases, but overall, I think it looks really good. Remember, the spec was better than 0.002% THD. Uh, that was 8 ohm loads, but it's looking pretty good as far as the THD. It's not meeting the actual specification, but who's going to complain about 0.03% THD? And in case you're wondering what the harmonics look like, they look kind of similar to what they did with the 8 ohm load case. Our odd or third harmonic right here is looking higher than the second or even harmonic right there, which is about what you would expect with solid state amps. But once again, that is not always the case. Here is the crosstalk from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with the DH500 putting out about 5 watts into 8 ohm loads for the active channel. And the specification is that at 1 kilohertz, it should be at least 60 dB. And we're in the, the 90 dB range, so we're well exceeding that requirement. And you can see that the worst case crosstalk here at 20 kilohertz, it turns out, is about 74 dB. Here is a plot showing the THD versus frequency at a couple different output power levels into 8 ohms from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And the specification was that it should be less than 0.0002%. And we're better than about 0.02% from the 5 would be an output power of about 150 watts and the minus 13 is about 2.5 watts. And that's into 8 ohms again. So it didn't meet the specification requirement of 0.0002%, but 0.02% is pretty darn good. Right now, I have a 1 kilohertz signal going into the DH500, and I've adjusted the input level so I get 1 watt into 8 ohms. Now, one of the specifications that we have is that the input sensitivity should be 0.0. 145 volts or 145 millivolts to give us one watt into 8 ohms and we're, we're pretty close 148 uh, that's pretty darn close and the other thing I've got the A weighting applied and there is a spec for SNR with one watt output and it should be better than 90 dB and we're better than 93 dB so it is meeting its requirements. Here is the TH500's multi-tone response with it putting pretty close to 5 watts into 8 ohms. And if you look at what the levels are, they translate to a distortion-free range of between 14 to 16 bits, which is pretty good. Here is the IMD response 
And we're looking at a range from 20 hertz to 50 kilohertz. Our two test tones are at 19 and 20 kilohertz here. And the main factor that you usually will see is the difference here at 1 kilohertz. And that's way, way down in the mud. I mean, we do have something here at 120 hertz, but that's not related to these two tones. The other two would be a kilohertz away from each one, and they're down pretty low. So the specification was that the IM distortion should be less than 0.007%. I'm not going to put this into my spreadsheet because I know it's going to be way, way, way better than that. This is really a good IMD distortion. This plot shows the THD versus output power level, and that's using a 1 kilohertz signal and 8 ohm loads. And the way you would read it is down here, we're at about maybe minus 14 dBV input, which equates to about 2 watts into 8 ohms. And over here at about minus 8 dBV, we're actually putting out close to 255 watts into 8 ohms. So you can see that our THD is better than 0.02%, just a tad under 0.01%. Uh, for the right channel anyway. Now the specification was it should be better than 0.0002%. We're off by a factor of 10, but I'm not going to worry about something at 0.02%. Here is the phase difference between the left and right output channels. Now the signal going in is 1 kilohertz, and it's putting out about 11 watts into 8 ohms. And what we're seeing is the difference in phase between those two channels. Actually, there is no difference in phase. This is just something I started doing. The uh, same signal, which is 1 kilohertz, is applied to both inputs. And neither left or right path is really changing the phase. If there was a phase change, you would start seeing this straight line becoming an ellipse or even a circle. And in case you were wondering what the rise time looks like, this purple square wave is a 1 kilohertz uh, square wave at 1 kilohertz and it's showing a rise time of about 36 nanoseconds. The yellow is the output. I believe it was the right channel and it's going into 8 ohms, probably about 3 watts or so. And it's showing a rise time of 2.02 microseconds, which you can kind of measure. Uh, I did a cursory measurement from here uh, to here and it's showing 2.58 microseconds. So it is pretty close to the calculated by the scope method. There is a spec for rise time. Now it was at 10 kilohertz and with an 80 volts peak to peak uh, output. And it's saying it should be 2.5 microseconds. So I'm pretty sure this thing would probably meet that, but this is just for comparison to other amplifiers as I start testing the rise time on them. I should point out once again that there is no capacitance in parallel with the 8 ohm load. As you saw from the test data, this particular Hafler 500 amplifier did an outstanding job of meeting its specifications, at least the ones I measured. And I think it was only off on the 1 kilohertz damping factor. Uh, I believe the spec was at least 200 and it was in the 130s, which is uh, outstanding anyway. And I've had very few amplifiers meet their damping factor specification. As far as any little quirks, it does have a couple. The RCA connectors in the back have a center conductor that is a uh, contact area, I guess I would call it, that is inset a little bit. And so you have to make sure that your RCA cable that you're plugging in has an extended center conductor, uh, or I guess one could replace these RCA connectors. But that was the only little uh, nit that I had with it. It, it kind of threw me off when I was testing because the center conductors on my test cables were making intermittent contact. Other than that, the fan, it does have a fan that's always on. It is a two-speed fan, and when I was doing some higher power testing, it did come on. Normally, you would expect that it would go off after the unit cooled down, but that did not happen after a half hour or so with just uh, noise going into the unit, and it powered on. The fan did not go to the normal uh, low speed. It wouldn't go to the low speed until I actually turned off the unit let it set for about 10 minutes and turn it back on and then it was on the low speed. It does have a couple of thermal switches that short out uh, a pair of resistors when the temperature gets uh, too hot. They're both the same value and I don't know why they don't reset to open back up and let the fan slow down, but 
that's just the way that this worked. As far as my listening tests, I hooked it up to my Wilson Watt 3 Puppy 2 loudspeakers and I used my Carver C1 preamplifier to drive it. Before I even hook up the preamp, I terminate the inputs in the back with shorts and I listen for hum or hiss and it was absolutely dead quiet. Then I hooked it up to the preamp and listened to a variety of music and this thing sounded just fine. I didn't think it lacked anything and it, it just did a really good job. And I was hitting probably in the low 90 dB SPLs and this thing was just coasting along. It didn't get hot at all. You can feel the top. Uh, it's just slightly warm, but definitely not hot at all. But it's, uh, I would say, a fairly cool running amplifier. As far as turn on thumps or pops, turn off, it didn't have anything turning on. When I turned it off, I did hear one little small thump uh, coming off of the left speaker in this case, but it, you know that stuff happens on older gear. As far as purchasing one of these, I did a quick check on eBay and saw some for $150 that were working uh, plus tax. If you wanted one of these, I think they're a great sounding amp. They tested great. Uh, Haffler seems to be a very well respected amplifier and you know, my, my own personal liking is I like to have at least clipping indicators or power meters or LEDs. So it wouldn't be an amp that I would seek for my personal needs. But other than that, it's, it's, a, it's a nice sounding and performing amp. So if you like this video, I would give it a thumbs up, of course. And if you have not subscribed to the channel, that would be great for you to do. I do have an upgraded version of the Hafler 500 that I will test in a future video. Uh, I forget the company that upgraded it, but it's a lot different on the inside from what I hear than this guy, so that will be interesting to test in the future. I also have a matching preamplifier for this guy, which I will be doing a review on at some point as well. If you have not subscribed to the channel, that would be a great thing to do to help the channel grow. Of course, you can leave your comments in the appropriate area here. And please give me a thumbs up if you thought I did a good job. And I guess if I didn't do a good job, you could give me a thumbs down, but please give me more thumbs up. So until next time, have a great day or night.